All right, so welcome back. This is the DO breakout session. <laughs> uh, so let me start a timer. Set a 45-minute timer. Start a timer for 50 minutes. <laughs> That's the way we have to operate. Siri. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, Wu-Tang is my... The Wu Tang Clan is my was my alarm timer song, so you guys will hear it. Anyway, so our objectives with this are to become very familiar with the new pump charts, go over the new pumping operations, and then we'll do one more last progressive pumping uh, problem. The point is to get you guys on the whiteboard, so I'm going to fly through some of this. So uh, some things before we were beginning, um, you know, as we used to add our GPM, uh, it was easy because it was 150, 300, 450. It was easy because it was 150 GPM increments. 180 is also easy. It's just like the revolutions of a spin. 180, 360, 540, 700, 720, 900, and so on and so forth. So if like you think of a snowboard, I know it's not like he just did it, but you can get the first. <laughs> You'll get through it. The more you skied or snowboard, the, the, more, the better you are at it. Uh, and if you see me about to draw on the wall, say something. All the problems we're going to do are progressive, so don't erase what you have until you see this. Uh, what we're introducing here is nothing new. I know a lot of people already write problems very similar to this. All we're doing is trying to standardize it a little bit. The way this pretty much works is, because um, remember, the PFA pumping JPR is modeled after putting lines in service quickly, which is exactly what we want to do. So we're developing a system to help us get there quickly. So uh, this isn't the only way to do this. We know there's a lot of different ways to do this. What we're here to tell you is this is successful and it works. So please give it a shot. If you hate it, you don't have to use it, but it's nice to also have a standard because there's plenty of situations where I've been on plenty of fires where DOs have uh, swapped out halfway through a fire. So if we've got problems written out somewhat similar fa fashion, you can return, uh, you can take over some of these engines really quickly. What this basically amounts to is writing your problem on your, um, on your door of your engine, charging your hose line, and then coming back and checking your math on the pump table. That's kind of what we're after here. The first step in this system is using a common, common symbols. So a fog nozzle is a triangle headed out. Just think of it like a fog nozzle fogging out. And a smooth bore is pointed in because it only has a straight stream as an option. We have our blitz fire. It's just a box with a fog nozzle off of it because that's what we have. A Y is just a V. A reducer is just a box. Uh, we want to kind of get away from using uh, a bunch of squiggly lines. We've got very limited real estate that we can use. So my, my pump uh, panel door is only about this wide. So if I start drawing problems all like this, this, if I've got you know a pre-connect, a two and a half pre-connect, that is the same as this. And I've taken up a lot less room and I've, I've really compressed it. And I can see from across the room exactly what, what we have. So try to get away from using uh, the squiggly lines. And if they say 300 feet, two slashes. 400 yep. feet, three slashes. See what it, it's just one less slash. Yeah, so one less slash. So if I get 400 feet, it's just one, two, three. It's minus one. If I've got 200 feet, it's just one. If I've got 300 feet, it's one, two. So you just take one away from the feet, and then you can get your lines up quickly. We think it's weird stuff. So. Um, you guys are kind of micromanaging. Yeah, we Sorry. are. We'll do, it, we'll do it even more when you get up the way. <laughs> we only need to label our hose line size um, if it's not inch and three quarters. So you can see if I run a supply to a Y and I'm labeling my hose line size all the way through, it just gets kind of messy. So when you see this, that's just an inch and three quarter pre-connect. If I don't label it, that's all it is. So this is simplified. If I take these off, it means the exact same thing. And our supply to Y is standardized now. It's always inch and three quarter and it's always three inch. So it's just an easy way to draw. We also want to keep track of our, we use our hose line prefix, which is keeping track of our discharge number and our engine number. Because if I've got discharge four and engine seven, engine seven is not going to say increase pressure on discharge four. They're going to say engine seven needs more pressure. So we need to know which line that is. Um, now we got to attach information. The way we do this is we put our GPM at the end of the hose line. Think about our GPM like flowing out of the hose line. And we put our discharge pressure that we get from our chart at the top of the line and circle it. The reason we circle it is it's super easy later. Because if I run, if I do this uh, old school and I have 60 pounds at the nozzle, 35 per section, and 130, when I'm back at my pump handle, I've got a lot of numbers to look at. Especially if you have multiple lines. Right, if I've got multiple lines. So if I just circle my pump discharge pressure, then I can recognize it really quickly. So circling your line pressure is nice. <clears throat> like I was showing you earlier, our chart only goes to 300 feet on an inch and three quarter pre-connect. So if I've got a 400 foot pre-connect, I got to do the I got to do the math manually. I'm getting my numbers from the charts, 
60 pounds at the nozzle, 35 PSI per section for a total of 140 in friction loss, 60 at the nozzle, I circle my total discharge pressure. And don't worry, we'll get a lot of practice doing this. Um, if I do a supply to a Y, I get my number off of my inch and three quarter pre-connect for one end of the Y, and I get my three inch friction loss over here. My two most common flows, 180 and 360, are already highlighted so I can recognize them quickly. So we're gonna show you this in full speed, what this looks like. Um, once again, we're after drawing, drawing the problem, charging the line, and coming back to the pump table. So Hal's gonna give me a problem, I'm gonna do this in full speed. Okay, engine four, uh, out port three, uh, common pre-connect. Engine three quarter pre-connect, it's 180 GPM. At 180 GPM, at 200 feet is 130 PSI. That took me five, maybe seven seconds to draw. Now I'm already walking over to charge my line. So I come over here, I mark my gauge at 130, I draw a quick image so I know which one is my pre-connect, and then I start pulling my line. Now I come back and bring things to my pump table. This is where we catch mistakes. Teaching this in the DO Academy and doing this over and over, this is where people catch their mistakes, and I'll show you an example in a second. So I'm just transferring that information over here. This is discharge number three. Four, engine three. Discharge oh, three. I'm sorry, discharge three, engine four. My nozzle pressure, my line pressure. There's two ways I can do this. I have my line pressure already stated, or I could do it old school and use my nozzle pressure and my friction loss. My nozzle pressure is 60, my friction loss is 35. So I can do 60 and 35 and 35, or I can already use the math that's in front of me here. The advantage to doing it this way, at least to start, is you'll get these numbers in your head and it'll make these putting these lines into service super quick. Because memorizing all these might be a little more difficult than just if I know 60 and 35, 50 and 11, I can put any of those lines into service really, really quickly. So when I transfer these numbers over to my pump table, I can either write 130 here, and I don't have any friction loss, friction loss, appliance or elevation. Is that am I on that? I don't think I am. <clears throat> For a total line pressure of 130 and my GPM of 180. Or I could do this another way. I could do 60 at the nozzle, my friction loss of um, 70 for a total of 130. I could do it either way. Just recognize that you got options for it. One advantage to doing it that way is you're going to memorize the nozzle pressures and friction losses. Pretty soon you'll be able to do it. Yeah, more. All right, how was my next line? Engine two, port number four, 300 feet of two and a half to an inch and an eighth tip. Inch and eighth tip is 266 GPM. I'll get to memorize that super quick after I use this. Once again, I have two options. I can just look at 300 feet, which is 83, or I use 50 pounds at the nozzle, which I get right here on my nozzle pressure, and 11 PSI per section. I can do it either way. So I've just drawn my problem. I come over here, I mark my gauge at 83. I draw my quick line so I know that it's a pre-connect with a smooth bore, and I bring it over to my table. I'm on discharge number four. Um, I've either got 50 at the nozzle and 33, or I'm just at 83, no matter either way I want to do it. I've got no other friction loss appliance elevation, so I'm at 83, and my GPM is 266. All right, how was my next problem? 300 foot supply to a Y, one side, and then two. All right, so I've got a supply to a Y. We'll say so, engine 10. So, um, engine 10. So I've got 180 GPM on an inch and three quarter pre-connect coming off a of supply to a Y. So that's gonna pump at 130. I get that right here. I lose 10 for my appliance. Now I gotta turn my friction loss, which I get off of my three inch friction loss right here. Right now I'm at 180 GPM. So I come over here, I lose three PSI per section for a total of nine, I'm at 130, 149. Now let's say I forgot my appliance, which is a common thing that we forget. So let's say I just do this math real quick before I come over here. And I'm like, okay, I'm at 39, 139. So I come over here. I mark my gauge at 139. I draw my quick supply to Y so I know what I'm dealing with. I mark my gauge and I come over here. And I'm like, engine 10, I'm on discharge 2. My nozzle pressure is 130 because I can just account that entire line as my nozzle pressure, right? So my nozzle pressure is 130. My friction loss in my 3 inch is 9. No additional friction loss, appliance is 10, elevation is nothing. Now I redo my math, 130, 149. Oh, I got 139 over here. I forgot my appliance. 
This is where you catch your mistakes. So, but we want to get a line into service quickly, right? So I draw my problem, I mark my gauge, I charge my line, then I come back to the table and check for mistakes and make adjustments as needed. Okay? You guys will get a lot of reps with this. I promise you, you'll be comfortable with it by the end. So um, we're going to do some examples before everyone gets up. Let me talk to the camera for a second. So if you're doing this at home, we're giving two handouts. These are available on Target Solutions. You've got the uh, pump chart. You've got the front and the back of the pump chart. And you've also got a handout with example pump problems. So the first thing we're going to do in this section is just finding things on the pump chart. So if you're at home doing this on your own, just pause the video and find all these on the pump charts. Don't do any math or anything like that. Just find all these. It's so on inch and three quarter pre-connect at 180 GPM. You're just going to point to it. It's going to be right here on the chart. So pause the video, find all these on the charts. Once you've found all those on the charts, unpause the video and then we'll work from there. All right, so now that we've found stuff on the chart, we're gonna do these problems together as a group. Here's problem one, we'll do this as a group, do all these in a row, transfer everything to your pump table. Um, so we're gonna draw the problem, go to the panel, write it out on the panel, then we're gonna go back in our pump table um, and charge the line. So we're gonna work problem one together, and these are all numbers that you get off the chart that are total line pressures. Then we're gonna go to problem two, and problem two are um, extended lines. So like our chart goes to 300 feet, so we're gonna do 400 feet. Our chart goes to uh, 300 feet on uh, two and a half, we're gonna go to 500 feet. So we're doing it traditionally with nozzle pressure and friction loss. So if you're at home doing this in the computer, do problem one, erase problem one, move on to problem two, and erase problem two. I'll leave it up here for a second and you can pause the video and then you'll get started again after um, you're done with those, start the video again. All right, so now that we're done with those problems, if you're watching it from home, basically what we're gonna do is a progressive problem. Everyone work at your own pace. We have problem one, erase it. Problem two, erase it. Problem three, erase it. We've got the time left in this class. We'll just use the rest of the time in this class to work these. Um, and then if you're at home, just pause the video, take a good look at these, pause the video, work through all these. And then when you're done, unpause the video and we'll keep going. I'll leave this going for just a second so you can pause it. All right, so if you're at home, welcome back. We finished doing our pump problems. What we're gonna do is, um, we're gonna talk about some changes to pump operations that's in the new DO manual. Um, and then we're going to uh, do one more progressive problem and then we'll kick you loose. So as you've learned just doing these, this is actually, if you just remember your nozzle pressure and your friction losses, the rest of this all comes super easy. So if we fade out everything on the chart we're not using a ton of, our inch and eight, our 180 GPM, if I remember 60 and 35, my inch and an eighth, if I remember 50 and 11, my inch and a quarter, if I remember 50 and 15, five PSI, if I'm extending a line, 180, 360 and 500. If I memorize those numbers, everything else is super easy to figure out. So those are, those are the main numbers and that's why it's nice to use the actual nozzle pressure or friction loss because you just burn those numbers in your head. And then what you find yourself doing is 300 foot, inch and three quarter pre-connect. 60, 35, 35, 35, 165. Then I just look at the chart. I do that all in my head real quick. I just look at the chart and make sure that I'm right. Does that make sense? So pump operations, um, this is all the new um, DO manual. Uh, everything we've talked about is in the DO manual, including the line drawings, how to draw them, transferring them, all that stuff's in the new DO manual. Most of this is super simple. I'm gonna jump around a lot. This is in no rhyme or reason. It's just some new pumping procedures and we want everyone to hear it. Once again, it's reinforced in the DO manual. So relay, the first thing we're gonna talk about is our governor setting when we're in relay. When we're relay pumping, you're always in RPM mode. Relay, RPM, people, PSI. If I've got people on the end of a hose line, my governor needs to be in PSI. If I'm in relay, I wanna be in RPM. Relay, RPM, people, PSI. Real easy to remember. The reason we're in relay is both governors are gonna sense an increase and decrease in flow as these lines shut down. So on this engine, as these lines open and shut, the governor is gonna increase or decrease RPM to compensate, right? That same increase and decrease in flow is happening in this hose line with this engine. 
So this engine is also sensing an increase and a decrease in flow. So it's also fluctuating as pr the pressure. In PSI mode. In PSI mode. So if, if both these engines are in PSI mode, both of their pressures are gonna fluctuate based on flow and they're gonna end up almost working against each other. What we can do to stabilize that flow, the relay engine pumps in RPM mode. That basically turns this engine into a hydrant. So as this engine increases or decreases flow, uh, their pump intake pressure is gonna decrease, but that's not a big deal. It's just like pumping from a hydrant. It's the same exact thing that happens when you pump from a hydrant. Relay RPM, people, PSI. We also have a new relay rule of thumb. In the old DO manual, it was like known GPM versus unknown GPM on two and a half, three inch, five inch. fifty PSI. So first off, we've eliminated two and a half inches of supply line, so it's always three inch, which leaves us with three inch and five inch. So our new rule of thumb for relay is 100 PSI in RPM mode to start. If you have to figure it out for whatever reason, we use 20 PSI nozzle pressure to maintain our residual pressure for our engine, friction loss appliance, and elevation. So let me show you how we got to 100 PSI mode in RPM, or 100 PSI in RPM mode. So if we're flowing two inch and three quarter pre-connects, a 360 GPM, with a tender shuttle, that's gonna be all we're gonna be able to support. Uh, this is in the DO manual too, just so you know, Adam, but you're welcome to take a picture. <laughs> so uh, this is a probable, very long supply line. This is a thousand feet of three inch at a probable flow, right? So for a tender shuttle, this is more than likely gonna be the most we're gonna flow. If we do our manual calculations, we lose eight PSI per hundred, and we're at a thousand feet, so 10 times eight is 80. 20 pounds extra residual um, for our nozzle pressure for our engine gives us 100 pounds. So there's our high end for our relay rule of thumb. Does that make sense? On our low end, if we just had three inch, 300 feet down, um, our nozzle pressure of 20, our friction loss of 24, because we only have three sections of 360 GPM for a total of 44. So we're over pumping that engine by 66 pounds, but that's not a big deal. It's just like they're taking in a hot hydrant. So it doesn't really affect their pumping operations, especially if we're in RPM mode. It's also good because we won't be pumping water to the ground because the intake relief valve is going off. Right, so we're under the intake relief valve pressure, which we're gonna set to 150, 175 next year during pump testing. When not to use the relay rule of thumb, we need to think about the second principle of uh, pressure. Fluid pressure at a point of fluid at rest is the same intensity in all directions. So if I'm flowing a hand line, I'm losing pressure due to friction loss in the hose. When I shut the hand line down, because water is incompressible or nearly incompressible, the nozzle pressure at the discharge equals the nozzle pressure, equals the pressure at the, I'm sorry, let me say that again. When static I shut the pressure. nozzle down, my pressure goes static and my discharge pressure equals my nozzle pressure because water's not flowing. So if I'm in a relay with multiple engines and water's not flowing and each engine is added 100 PSI, the first engine adds 100 PSI, the second ad engine adds 100 PSI, which gives this engine 200 PSI when water's not flowing. When water's flowing, we're losing pressure due to friction. When water stops flowing, we're not. So that means this intake pressure would reach 200 PSI, which is which would set off our intake pressure relief valve. Keep in mind, if you're in series, at idle, your engine's gonna generate approximately 100 PSI. Right. So uh, if we have multiple relays, engines in a relay, which is probably never gonna happen, if we do, it'd probably be better to use that formula to figure it out, the 20 PSI nozzle pressure, friction loss appliance elevation, because it'll lower our pressure a little bit and hopefully keep our intake pressure relief valves from going off. But this is a not a very common operation. Completely switching gears to valves. So when your valve is completely off, obviously your waterway is completely off. An anomaly that happens with valves, here we see a valve that's about 20, 30% open. We see our waterway is only about 10% open. This happens across all valves, whether it's manual, electronic, butterfly, ball, all types of valves. So this is why when you're charging a line or bringing in a hydrant, you don't generally start seeing water until you hit that 20% mark, because that's when the valve actually starts to open. <clears throat> we see when we get about 70% open on the valve, we see we're about 50% open on the valve. So that's just something to think about. Another thing to think about is the linkage. On our manual valves, whether it's the tank fill or a discharge uh, valve, we have all this linkage that reroutes um, the handle to the, t to the valve itself. So that first two inches on a pull valve, that first two, three inches is all just slop. It's removing that play in the linkage before you actually start manipulating the valve. Same thing happens on your tank recirc, that turning valve. You might get a full turn of that before you actually start manipulating that valve and it's the resistance you feel is when you're actually manipulating it. On hydrant transfers, 
Remember, a lot of times when we bring in hydrants and we're training, we just use our pony sections. So we get used to bleeding the air out of that, which happens in like two seconds. Remember, if you've got a 500 foot lay with five inch down, that's a lot of air to bleed out of that line. So remember that takes a long time to bleed out and you wanna bleed all that air before you do your hydrant transfer because uh, that air pushing through the pump will cause problems. Remember, we don't always have to use five inch. We can get three, about a thousand GPM through three inch. So think about that if you're laying into a small house fire, if you're uh, at a dumpster fire or a car fire, it's a lot of hose you don't need to pick up, just run three inch. But if you connect three inch to the hydrant, put the valve on the other side so you can add a three inch if you needed to. Right, so you could lay two dual three inch lines. Make sense? Remember, pressure is additive when you're bringing in a hydrant. So if I might, so here's my pump and my pump is in series. So I'm pumping from one impeller to the next because I'm in series stage on the pump. If I bring in 100 PSI hydrant, each impeller is adding roughly 50 PSI. So if I have 100 PSI hydrant, my first impeller adds 50 PSI, my next impeller adds 50 PSI, and now I'm at 200 PSI at idle. What's my first line going to service out on an inch and three quarter? 130, right? So that means at idle, um, I have 70 extra pounds to manage with 100 PSI hydrant when I'm in series on my pump. Does that make sense? So one way I can help mitigate that, and the problem with that is at idle, my governor can help me if it's got RPM to play with. But when I'm at idle, my engine can't go below idle. It can't regulate pressure below idle. So your governor can't help you out at all here. So one thing I can do to help mitigate this, and especially because with the mystery hose, our, our line pressures are going down. So with 130 PSI line pressure, if I'm in volume stage on my pump, I bring in 100 PSI pump, If I bring, bring in 100 PSI hydrant and I'm in series, I now add 50 pounds in instead parallel. of 100, um, or parallel, I now add 50 pounds instead of 100. So my 100 PSI hydrant added to my idle speed on my pump of 50 PSI equals 150. So I've taken 50 pounds away just by changing pump stages. Does that make sense? Cool. That's something I can do. Another thing to think about when you're bringing in that long hydrant lay, we've got intake bleeders and intake drains. Bleeders are at the top because they're meant to evacuate air. Drains are at the bottom because they're meant to drain it. So when I bring in a hydrant, I can open both of those and evacuate that quicker. But remember, if I open up the drain instead of the bleeder, uh, that can be a problem too because I'm not gonna evacuate all the air and I'm gonna push uh, air through my pump. Gauge locations and foam manifold drain. So this is a really crude drawing of our discharge of our pump. So we've got our pump and our primary discharge where all of our lines come off of. The first split in this manifold is non-foam lines and foam lines. This keeps foam out of our non-foam lines. In order to keep foam out of our non-foam lines, there's a check valve. So water can move this way, but not this way. What ends up happening when you shut your pump down, your line discharge valves are closed, and this check valve stores pressure in this side of the pump. So that stored pressure over time can deteriorate these check valves along with the foam that's in there. So if we don't bleed that pressure, we end up deteriorating this check valve and that's why a lot of our um, engines leak by. Um, and they'll put foam in a non-foam lines because these check valves are deteriorating. There's a foam drain here. It's located on your pump panel on the bottom left. It'll say foam drain, foam manifold drain, something like that. Every time you're done pumping, whether it's on a Saturday check, out at the pit or whatever, just get in the habit of cracking that and bleeding that pressure. You don't need to leave it open for 10 minutes and completely drain it, just, just bleed that pressure. Um, I almost made this part of my daily check. When I go to the engine, I just crack it real quick and make sure I don't have any pressure on that. Uh, the last thing we're gonna talk about on this is pump discharge pressure versus line pressure. The pump discharge pressure gauge is the first gauge that happens that comes right after the pump. My line pressure gauges are substantially downstream. I experience friction loss in this plumbing just like I do in hose. So if I'm at a higher flow rate, say 1000 GPM, the higher my flow rate, the more my friction loss based on my pipe diameter, right? So if I'm flowing 1000 GPM, I experience substantial friction loss between this gauge and these gauges. So that's why a lot of times your pump discharge pressure is higher than your line pressure, especially if you're flowing a lot of water. So your line pressure gauge may say 130, but my pump discharge pressure gauge may say 150, 160. It's pretty common, especially at higher flows. Just something to keep in mind. That ties into pump capacity. At a draft with one section of five inch at 10 feet of lift, this is my pump capacity. This is at a draft. 150 PSI, I have full pump capacity of 1500 GPM. As I increase my pressure, my pump uh, efficiency goes down. At 200 PSI, I go down 30%, I'm at 1050. 
at 250 PSI, my pump capacity is halved um, and my GPM is 750. It's important to remember when you're at a hydrant, you're gaining pressure from that hydrant and gaining volume from that hydrant. So at a hydrant, um, really what's important is to maintain 20 PSI residuals so we don't cavitate the water main. So our pump discharge, our pump capacity could be two, three, four thousand, five thousand GPM if we were at a really good hydrant. That's the main discharge pressure? Yes. Not the line pressure. Correct. That's based on main line pressure. When we're pumping from the aerials, our new rule of thumb is to begin pumping at 150 PSI. That's all aerials. And we're going to use the truck crew. We're going to treat this just like high rise. We're going to use the pressure gauge and the flow meter on the aerial and go from there. Um, always maintain 20 PSI residual. We're flowing big water. We want to make sure we maintain that. Use our high pressure hose if we can. And remember, you may be the only valve. Not all the aerials have intake, uh, intake valves, so you might be the only valve that's showing water. Use all the ports from the hydrant. Park the engine close to the hydrant and then give a longer supply line to the aerial. By tapping all the ports from a hydrant, so in this case, I've used a section of five inch and two sections of three inch. By tapping the three inch ports on this as well, I increase my hydrant capacity by at least 30%, which may not seem like much, but if you're throwing three, 4,000 GPM, that's a ton of water. That extra 30% can go a long way. So when you're pumping to the aerials, preparing to pump big water in some sort of weird relay, tap all the ports on the hydrant. Two tips as you train. We pump from a draft a lot when we train. Pack, practice pumping from a hydrant in your area. Um, we always see people forget residual and static pressure a lot on their intake gauge. Um, and if you pump from a hydrant more, um, it'll help with that. The majority of the time we're pumping from a draft when we train, the majority of the time at a fire, we're gonna be on a hydrant. Right, so. so practice like you play. Remember, we can train in our area with hydrants that have this red stripe on the bonnet. They're located uh, on water mains with positioning that won't um, cause debris to stir up in the line in the water main, which kicks debris downstream, which can then get in people's washing machines and all that kind of stuff. So if we just, you can train in your area from a hydrant, just use the ones with a red bonnet. Um, we have this Conics box notebook. This is out at the pump pit for everyone to use. It's in the hose Conics box. This has got all the PFA JPRs, the pump charts, it's got all the rodeo course information. Um, it's all there as a reference for you. It's always in there. Please keep it in there. Uh, but it's a reference for everyone to use. One of the things that on it is, is a description of the discharge manifold. Um, hooking, hooking up to the manifold to the right ports can simulate somewhat accurate flows. So these are designed to flow somewhat accurate flows at consistent pressures. So these two simulate an inch and three quarter. These two simulate either a supply to a wire or two and a half, and these two simulate blitz fires. That way we can, so we can flow somewhat accurate pressures, um, somewhat accurate flows, and then our, our pump behaves the way it should at those flows. So let's do one last progressive problem, and then um, we'll get out of here. <coughs> so if you're at home, we're gonna do one last progressive problem. So run this problem, keep track of your total GPM, and then when you're done, we're gonna answer some questions. So if you're at home, go ahead and pause it right now, do this problem, and then unpause it when you're done. All right, if you're at home, we're gonna run through a couple um, examples here. So we're gonna ask ourselves some questions based on what we just learned. What's the pump discharge pressure? What's our pump discharge pressure? 185, what is it probably closer to? Probably closer to 200, right? Because that's that difference between line pressure and pump discharge pressure, remember? Where those gauges sit. So we're probably closer to 200. How are we controlling the pressure in the other lines? Gaining back, good. Should, uh, should you be in pressure or volume stage on the pump? Volume. volume. I'm leaving my pump in volume stage all the time. It just makes sense for hydrant transfers. I can always give the maximum amount of water. One of the reasons uh, we went to two stage pumps in the fire service is we had a problem with engines overheating and we needed them to pumps to be more efficient. That's less of a problem now. Um, so, you know, we can pump in volume stage all day at maximum flow. So um, that's why I'm keeping it in pump stage. I'm not saying you need to, but it's just something to think about. Have a good reason for what you do. Should your governor be in RPM or PSI mode? PSI, right? People? PSI. PSI, relay, RPM, good. The incident commander calls for an additional inch and three quarter line to be put in service. Assuming you're pumping from a draft, can you do it? Yeah. Yeah, can you? What's your pump discharge pressure? That's what determines it. For your pump capacity. Look at your pump capacity on the top of the chart in the blue section. 
What's our pump capacity? We're already about there, right? So we're at 1050. So putting at draft an inch and three quarter line, it's gonna be hard to put it into service. Could you put more lines in service if you had a hydrant supply? As long as you maintained what? 20 PSI residual, awesome. Awesome job, guys. So we have handouts for you. Let me cover these real quick before you break. Don't split up and look up here real quick. Everyone's gonna get a DO manual and make sure they can see this at home. So everyone's gonna get a DO manual. All this information is inside. Everyone's also getting these handouts. If you look up here, you've got a pump chart you can practice with and we've got example pump problems for you guys to do at home. So take these home and uh, practice and we'll see you guys in November. Yeah, so you're above. Oh.